You are listening to the Make Change Happen podcast series from the International Institute for Environment and Development, IIED. We are producing more food than ever, but for citizens across the world, now and in the future, food security is further and further away. To counter this, an advocacy program called Sustainable Diets for All is asking, how can we create food systems that are more sustainable, healthier and fair? IID and Dutch development aid organization HEVOS are working together with local partners to support civil society organizations fighting for diverse food production and better, affordable diets for everybody. Joining us today to discuss their work, we have two researchers from the Sustainable Diets for All program and some of their in-country colleagues. Hello and welcome to Make Change Happen, IID's new podcast. Um, I'm Liz Carlisle, I'm Director of Communications and your host today, and we're going to be looking at sustainable diets for all. Um, And I have two colleagues with me here in the room. Um, On my left is Alejandro Guarín, and you are a senior researcher at IIED. And Alejandro, it says that you are leading on our agro-food systems work. What does that mean? Can you tell our listeners what that means in an easy language? Hi, Liz. Of course. It means I'm looking at all things food-related, from production, farming, to processing, transport, trade, consumption. So that's what we call food systems or agro-food systems. Brilliant. And I think you've had quite a long history in that work. And my understanding is that before you joined us, you were at the German Development Institute in Bonn, DIE. That's right. And I think you've done consultancies with FAO, and local governments in your home country of Colombia. That's right. Great. On my right, I'm joined by Costanza de Toma, and Costanza works with us here in IID as well, but has been in international development for many years, uh, a trained social anthropologist, and uh, I think your focus, and certainly with us, your focus has been on advocacy and helping our partners um, develop a advocacy program on this particular project but I also know I think that you have some sort of foodie history in your family do you want to say a couple of words about that yes hello Liz yes yes of course I was just reflecting on that earlier today and um, in my family history um, I can trace back to my grandparents both sets of grandparents actually one migrated from the south to the north of Italy and they opened a wine and food shop in the north of Italy, in Lecco, um, where my grandmother used to um, cook for uh, over a hundred factory workers every wow. day. And my other set of grandparents opened a coffee shop in Milan where they uh, ground and toasted and served coffee to travellers because the shop was near the central station, train station in Milan. So food, big tradition in your family. And we'll be hearing a little bit more about the importance of tradition and culture and food. Yes. We will be joined throughout the program from uh, three of our partners in Bolivia, in Kenya and in Zambia. They will be on Skype, but we will look forward to introducing them into the conversation. And we're going to focus today on sustainable diets. And I think the big question is the f- what is for all? What does sustainable diets for all mean um, to us in IID? And what's the work we're going to do? And thinking about how um, the SDG goal two says that by 2030, we want to end hunger and ensure access for all, especially the poorest, to safe, nutritious and sufficient food all the year round. I think for IID and our determination that the poorest group should not be compromised, that's quite a big issue. So what what does this mean for us, Alejandro? Let's break it down. So Sustainable Diets for All is the name of a big project we have. It's funded by the Dutch government, but it really encapsulates this idea of that's really important about how do we make diets and what we eat more sustainable and how do we make that available to everybody. That's in a nutshell, but let's, let's break it down a little bit. What does sustainable diets actually mean? And I think at the core, it's two very simple things. It's diets that are good for planet and good for people, mm-hmm. that are nutritious, that are safe, that are 
um, that have all the nutrients and all the, all the characteristics that people need to be healthy, but that at the same time, in producing it, uh, that it doesn't destroy the planet mm -hmm. and that it uh, preserves our ecosystems, water, biodiversity. So that's what the sustainable diets means. It's relatively simple. It's really hard to actually achieve, but mm. it's, it's, it's relatively simple. And then the for all bit, which is a bit of a twist that we have on that, is okay, right, we know what's healthy for planet and for people, but it's relatively easy to achieve if you're wealthy living in the UK. Because you can buy nice organic vegetables that are really sustainably produced and that they're really good for you. But what does that mean for, say the poor people in Uganda or working people in Bolivia. That's, mm. It might be different, and it actually is different. And so the for all bit is a really interesting bit for us about what that relatively straightforward thing of sustainable diets actually mean for all. So I think what's interesting to me is that that raises these issues around sort of we, you've got your health that you hope to you hope to keep healthy. You've got this problem of sustainability. You've got perhaps the challenge of diversity. You know, for many people where diets are difficult, they need a diverse diet to keep healthy. So I can see that we're wrapped up in difficult, complex choices around access, around culture, around um, questions of choice. So, Costanza, tell us a little bit. I know we were talking earlier before we started around this question of sort of choice and culture. Of course. The, um, uh, what Alejandro was saying is, is very important because <clears throat> we've worked on, uh, uh, on the Sustainable Diets for All program for a few years now, and it's been a journey for us uh, as well as for our partners in, uh, in the five different countries that we've been working in. So we've worked in Uganda, Bolivia, Indonesia... Uh, Zambia and Kenya and I think we've understood that, that sustainable diets means something different uh, in, in every context and because we've not only taken a food systems approach in our programming work but also a we've tried to take a bottom-up citizen driven mm -hmm. approach uh, in the program we've um, we've tried to listen to citizen voices about the food system. Uh, we've tried to listen to producers, to, uh, uh, to marketers, uh, to the people who cook the food, as well as to the consumers who eat the food. And I think we've, we've um, busted a few myths along the way, and we've also come across a few hard truths along the way, which have questioned our own beliefs and preconceptions and an assumptions on what sustainable diets are, particularly on the for all element, as Alejandro was saying. Um, so the importance of, of um, uh, access in terms mm -hmm. of where do low income families get their food? Is that food of, of sufficient quality enough to, uh, uh, to make their diet healthy, uh, to make their diet sustainable? And, and what is the relationship between what people eat, what people choose to eat, forgetting access for a moment here, what they choose to eat, and their identity? And we've realized, I mean, it might come as no surprise to many people that there's a very, very strong link between food and identity and cultural identity. And part of what we've worked on in the program has been revaluing um, traditional indigenous foods and looking at the nutritional value of these foods and why, if they're so good for people's health, why have they been sidelined in terms of production? Um, we've been working in Zambia, for instance, looking at why is production so focused on maize, for instance, in Zambia. And, and a lot of the healthy crops have been sidelined along the years. Uh, or why have diets changed so radically in, in many different um, countries, from Indonesia to Uganda to Bolivia? Um, and why are people eating more unhealthy foods, rich in sugar, starch, carbohydrates, leaving aside local, maybe sometimes healthier foods. So that's where we get this concern, I think, particularly a concern at World Food Day this year in October that was really showing the difference between we have 800 million people who can go hungry every day, but we also have uh, 1.2 billion people who are overweight 
and becoming obese. So I think what you're showing is we've got this polarization. So we've got health and choice for poorer people and then unhealthy foods consumed by people which are processed foods in more formal markets, that kind of thing. Um, I wonder, did it uh, might be nice to hear from Vladimir Garcia from Bolivia. He was saying something that in his project was very much about the culture of choice. So hi, my name is Vladimir Garcia and I've been working on the project with informal food vendors and food markets here in Bolivia. I'm a sociologist and I've been working on this project for the past year and a half. So in regards to the question, I think um, something rewarding about, about this project is that um, well, while working on this uh, topic, I've read somewhere that when, uh, in Thai, I think, when you don't like something, uh, you don't say, you, I don't like this food or it is bad. So you actually say, I don't know how to eat this. And I think that was such an important such an important framework on this project uh, in regards to, to how you approach food because it, it shows you are willing to open to new experiences and to sense new flavors and aromas and to learn to appreciate meals and foods that you are not familiar with. So um, popular market diners here in Bolivia are places where working class people and low income workers go get their foods on a weekly basis as we found on, in our research and they do heavily depend on these spaces. So I think that many Bolivians do not really have the chance to visit popular market diners as often as we would like. Uh, the country has sort of experienced a, a boom of restaurants and coffee places and food places. Uh, but in that sense, market diners have remained uh, sort of invisible in the food scenes, even though they played an important role in feeding people. So I think uh, we're missing out on amazing food and a variety of meals that many of us have not tasted yet. And it was re rewarding in that sense to, to learn to reappreciate Bolivian cuisine. Let me, maybe for the benefit of our, of our listeners, Vladimir is, is referring to, to something called uh, market diners. Let me give you a kind of sense of what that is, because it's it's... It's material to the whole sustainable diets for all thing. He's referring to in La Paz and as in other Latin American countries, food markets, basically open markets where people go to buy their, their, their vegetables and fruits and meat and all sorts of things. They have people cooking. And so you can go and buy stuff, cooked stuff to eat. So he's talking about, this is a fixture of the Bolivian landscape, these, these big kitchens, basically, open kitchens where people, working class people mostly come in and at lunchtime or for breakfast they come in and they buy their lunch or their, 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 their food, but it's cooked. And what he's saying, what Vladimir is saying, is saying, well, there's two really important things that this is doing. One is it's providing key food access for working people. So this is not a, a, um, a kind of hobby type of thing. This is like crucial for the, for the, for the feeding of the city. But, on the, uh, but also, in addition to that, they're the reservoirs of culture and traditional knowledge about food. So in a way, they're also bastions against this westernization of diet. So it's, there's these two things going on at the same time, where they're providing food for the working people, but they're also, in a way, the front line of the resistance against highly processed food. So they're also, they're also keeping um, a, almost vigilant of the, of the, um, of the traditional uh, cooking of Bolivia. So I think that leads us quite nicely, doesn't it, to this, uh, the relationship between informal markets or the informal setting and kind of the food system that we need to make access and choice available to the poorest communities. Um, and I think your expertise, Alejandro, is very much around how these informal markets work and why they're important. And I think maybe could you tell our listeners the difference between the sort of the informal and the formal, uh, because I know that, we, you know, our colleague from Kenya will give us a very yeah. nice example about yeah. that difference, yeah. but it might be helpful to share your thinking on that. Yeah, it's very simple. So for our listeners in the UK and other parts of, of let's say, Europe or the United States, 
when we think of what the food market looks like, we usually think of supermarkets. That's where we buy our food, and that's 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 our 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 main source of food is a supermarket. Basically, your your decisions are there which supermarket to go to. But these are the main sources of food, and that's because supermarkets, most of the food production and distribution is organized around supermarkets. In developing countries, that's not the case. Supermarkets are a very small portion of the big food system. So what does it actually look like? Well, it's actually small scale. It's small scale in production, so it's small scale farming, producing very small amounts of food. Then it's small scale in retail, so it's all sorts of corner stores and open air markets. So food is produced and sold in very, very small scale. It's the people who work in this food um, system. It's usually, they don't hire anybody, so it's family based. You know, so it'll be like the mother will be tending uh, the stall, and then maybe the cousins might be bringing in the food from the countryside, and then the brother is the one distributing it, for example. So it's cash-based, so there's no contracts, nothing is written, it's all verbal, it's based on loyalty. And so this is, this is a very rich and dynamic system that is really feeding most of the world right now. And, and it's a little bit churning in the background and, and not really like in the radar of people, but it's just feeding most mm-hmm. of the world right now. So that's, that's what we mean by the informal market. And there's a tendency, isn't there, for, um, I suppose, governments or local governments to want to make things more formal. Uh, they want to draw draw those small businesses into a more formal setting. But I think what we're saying is that that informality is, provides a rich culture and a rich opportunity for people. Exactly. Uh, government doesn't like it. It doesn't fit their idea of what a modern food system needs to be and... Yes, I think what what strikes me from what um, Vladimir was saying as well is that these markets are very often invisible, and they're invisible for a choice. Uh, they're deliberately invisible because they most of them operate under the radar precisely because governments have been so uh, anti informal markets and because they've they've either been swept away when there's been outbreaks of cholera, for instance, um, recently, um, only recently in Lusaka, for instance, um, or, or simply because they're unsightly and in, considered to be unhealthy. So one of the myths, actually, that we, um, I think we've contributed to busting as uh, uh, sustainable diets for all has been that the food that these markets provide is, is unhealthy because that is very often not the case and these uh, markets not only are the for the source of food for the majority of the poor particularly the urban poor of course we're referring to mostly um, but also they provide healthy um, a healthy variety of, of foods for these people um, either cooked or uncooked. Of course, there are problems with hygiene at times, but that's mostly because of the infrastructure in these markets. Um, So not only do they provide a a significant source of employment, as Alejandra was just saying, for families, but they also provide an essential source of of, um, healthy, diverse diets for working people. I think, Alejandro, I saw your hand. No, 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 no. I, I was just, I was gonna, I was going to, to say, Costanza has has said a couple of really mm. important things that I wanted to highlight, which is the 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 whole nutrition aspect of these markets, and as as I think we'll hear from my colleague Mangiza in Zambia, the these these are providing food, but it's not just food; it's nutritious food, and it's not just nutritious; it's affordable, and for the most part, it's safe. So it's, it's actually fulfilling quite an important role and, and in a country like Zambia, which is very poor and where people do not have money to go to a supermarket, for example. These informal markets are providing safe, affordable nutrition. Yes, let's hear from Mangiza now. My name is Mangiza Chong on the Sustainable Dias for All program here in Zambia. Uh, and one of the aspects of the Sustainable Dias for All program has been work on informal markets. 
Um, on this particular work, we did a research which was meant to find out what are the characteristics of the informal markets, informal food markets uh, in Zambia, and um, what are the challenges, what are the perspectives from the consumers and the policymakers. And what was very surprising uh, to me uh, was that during the time that the research was being done, I, I listened to a radio station uh, called Komboni Radio here in Zambia, and that particular radio station deals with um, people who live and work in compounds. And so this presenter was asking the, the callers uh, on what they had eaten and whether it was sufficient for them, whether, whether it was balanced. And to my surprise, everybody else that called in was saying that they had eaten some form of protein, meat, fish, vegetables, grains, and fruits. And so it occurred to me at that point that work on the informal sector is not about access. It's more about the nutritional aspect of it. So as we went along with the research, I started paying attention to what are the prices in the informal markets or like why is it that the people who are working in the informal markets are actually saying that they, they are getting um, the various types of food that they need from these markets. And I realized that the same food that is in the supermarkets, for, for instance, if you look at fish, which is selling at three or four dollars per kilogram, in the informal markets, it's selling at 50 cents. So for sure, they can afford the, the variety of the food that is there. So the question then is, what should be our issue? What should be our focus? And so in our work, we, we started working with the government organization that is looking into nutrition to kind of um, work on how we can make uh, the nutrition aspect of the food in the informal sector good enough for the people that are consuming. And it was so interesting to find that about 90% of low-income households are getting their food from this informal sector. And almost half the population that, that is uh, across the, the income brackets are getting their food for, for the informal sector. So it became really important for us to look into um, the nutrition aspect. So once we did this study, we also looked at what what are the alternatives that we can propose to government. And that was one of the really difficult things that we found. Because for government, what we realized is that their perspective is that they want to formalize and they, they don't want to, uh, they think that they cannot work with the informal sector in the way that it is right now. And when we looked at the alternatives around, it seems there are not so many innovations on, on working with the informal sector in its current state. And I think the answer lies with the the population, the traders themselves, on what kind of innovations can we do to work around um, the, the things that they are doing in, in the current state of the informal sector. I think that's, um, that's very true. What Mangiza says is, uh, is one of the aspects that we have been looking at in, in our work across different countries, because of course informal food markets um, have been a, um, uh, a, a red thread uh, going through uh, a lot of our work in sustainable diets for all. Um, what she says about the, the change lies within the vendors themselves is partly true. I think what we've also been doing is, and what Mangisa doesn't, hasn't mentioned, but is a very important part of the work that she's doing right now in, in Lusaka, is um, working with local authorities um, to um, uh, facilitate the dialogue with all actors within the food system, in including, of course, the traders, the vendors, um, as well as consumers and, and others, transporters and, uh, and producers, to set up um, food councils. Um, what are food councils? I mean, these are just platforms um, that allow structured dialogue between the different actors and the local government to come up with a coherent and consistent urban food policies, bringing in the voices of these um, invisible people within the food system. So we said that informal food markets are often invisible, either by choice or not. Um, but how can they be listened to? Because, of course, they are part of the food system. What fascinates me the most, and, and I'm, I am a, a newcomer to food systems, unlike Alejandro, is how these different food systems that we've mentioned so far can coexist 
within uh, within the same context, um, uh, feeding different people within the same city, for instance, and how can they work together? So this is one of the uh, solutions that we've been looking at in terms of the food councils and looking at, co at a coherent food policy. Um, and it's been fascinating for me as an advocate to see how our colleagues in Zambia, for instance, have applied some of the lessons and the models that have been developed, successfully developed, in, um, in some cities in Bolivia, for instance. So we're organizing, in January, we'll be organizing an exchange, a learning exchange between partners and colleagues in, from Zambia and Bolivia to look at what they've learned and, and how they've applied uh, this concept in, in very, very different contexts. So I don't know, would you agree with that, Alejandro? You've worked more, um, uh, particularly in Bolivia. Yeah, I think on those food councils, it's it, there are really interesting solution to a to a, a difficult problem actually, which is we've said these markets are important. They feed a lot of people. They provide nutritious food. All that stuff is true, but governments tend to adopt one of two positions around these markets. One is ignore or or benign neglect. Just let them be, but don't include them in discussions. Don't um, make them part of policy. So the councils are are fix, trying to fix that. They're saying, well. They exist and they have something important to say. And then, in the worst cases, they're repressive. They say, not only we do not like you, but we're going to like chase you with the police. And this happens, and it's very common, actually, that street vendors, for example, are harassed and persecuted by the police. And again, the food councils might be a good opportunity to, to mollify some of these positions, to say, I recognize these actors as legitimate and important. I'm not going to chase them with the police. I'm going to bring them to the table and see how we can work constructively. And I guess there's a real challenge or a tension too between kind of the national government directive. I know particularly in Zambia where food security is a really big issue and um, there's, a, there's a great focus on maize. Um, and making sure that there is enough maize coming through the system so that people can be fed. But the challenge then, if you look at a more bottom-up approach, where you're looking at actually individuals' diets, are they healthy, are they nutritious, are they sustainable, you have, you have that tension. So I suppose we've been focusing on this kind of bottom-up, but you've got then this tension of, at a national level between a kind of food security debate and then these food councils or food platforms. And I suppose this same tension around this kind of formal, informal is always going to be a bit of a challenge. That's a really good example, actually, the Zambia thing, because it's, a, as you say, the, the government policy on food and nutrition is very maze-based. And that's because, for good reasons, actually, when there were huge challenges with hunger and malnutrition, that was a crop mm -hmm. that could be easily stored, distributed, etc. But what I think is interesting in Zambia is, so it's easy to come to Zambia as an external person and say, oh, no, you need to get beyond maize, you know, it's a bad thing. And, and that's not our thing. That's not our, our way of working. Mm. But there's an actual groundswell of Zambian civil society activists, campaigners have, who have recognized this. They don't need anybody to come from the UK to tell them that this is a problem. And so there's a broad alliance of people in Zambia who are working towards diversification of, of maize, and this includes farmers, activists, NGOs. And what's really interesting is that that's... So we come in almost to just chime in with something that is already happening. Mm -hmm. And increasingly also the government is realizing that this, that this agenda of diversification is, is needed. But it, that, when, when I say this was a good example is because I think it's a, it's, it really shows how what we call what sustainable diets means. It cannot be coming from outside. It cannot be imposed. It needs to come from within. And for very good reasons and through all sorts of different pathways, the people of Zambia realized that diversification was an important thing and they put it on the agenda and we come to we come to help a little bit but it's it's a real it's a real um, uh, it's a key for success it will not work if you have people helicoptering from outside to tell them what sustainable diets means yes yeah, so there's no one size fits all 
This is all about local context. Right. It's all about local tradition, all about local culture, all about local organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, did we want to hear from our colleague in Kenya? I think um, she had a very nice example about, um, was it the milk market there? Um, and this, this same thing around the relationship between health and prices and the, and the opportunity that the informal market gave uh, for people's diets. So I'm Emma Blackmore. Um, I'm an IIED research associate based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, and I am the Kenya lead on the IIED Ilri More Milk Research Project. So the biggest thing that struck me from my work on informal milk markets in Kenya was just how effective these markets actually are in terms of providing what low-income consumers seem to want, which is raw milk, at convenient locations and affordable prices. And whilst we need to acknowledge the safety risks of drinking raw milk, um, we should consider that much of this risk is actually mitigated through the boiling of milk at home, which most Kenyans actually do before they drink the milk. They take the milk in chai, which is a type of stewed tea. Um, what's more is that typically speaking, the risks of drinking raw milk, which has been boiled, doesn't actually exceed the risk of drinking pasteurized milk from the formal sector, which isn't necessarily safe either. Um, interestingly, consumers also prefer the taste of raw milk because it has more butter fat content than pasteurized milk. We should also bear in mind that informal milk markets pay more to producers for their milk than the formal market does. Um, and this means overall that these markets are likely leading to greater livelihood and nutrition gains for poor people than the formal market. And this is something that the government doesn't seem to acknowledge. They either neglect the informal sector or try to stamp it out altogether. But these markets are working well despite government rather than because of it. So, Cos, some nice examples there. Yes, I think it um, reiterates some of the things that we've been saying with a, yet another example. I like the way she says um, how markets are functioning despite uh, the government rather than uh, as a result of government support, uh, which links into the invisibility and it links into the fact that, that, that government is often trying to stamp them out or, or, or uh, um, sweep them under the carpet. Um, but what I really wanted to um, come in on was uh, what Alejandro was saying before we heard from uh, Emma, because it really um, hits a chord with um, the advocacy work that I'm focusing on in the program. And, and again, it is one of the lessons, I think, that we have come to um, uh, realise uh, that we've learnt uh, as part of our bottom-up advocacy approach. So what we've been doing is identifying, putting our finger on and trying to understand and then nurture local agendas and initiatives around food and food systems. So as Alejandro was saying, um, with regard to the Zambia example, we didn't just come in one day and, and arrive in Lusaka and decide that crop diversification was the way forward. There, there were people there that had been working on this, perhaps for many years in some cases, and, and they were coming together. And that is precisely what, what we have to do. And we, we, what we've tried to do as Sustainable Diets for All, it, it hasn't been to um, roll out our own agenda our own external agenda coming in. But it's been more sitting down with people and saying, OK, we're talking about food today. What's happening in your area? What, what's happening in this context? What, what are the dynamics? Who are the key people in the food system? What are the problems? You know, and trying to identify hotspots of... of um, uh, of agency, as we as we like to call it, perhaps in a in a very intellectual way, of of um, dynamism uh, between citizens. What are the initiatives that we can support? And my role uh, with regard to the advocacy has been precisely that: working with these either groups of citizens or community-based organisations or fully fledged uh, CSOs, civil um, uh, civil society organisations to help them take their agenda forward and to build their capacity to work together, so facilitate these partnerships between them, 
with the people across the food system and try to um, distill the key messages. So identify the problem, of course, as, as any advocate would, uh, would always start with, and, and then distill the key messages and then help them articulate um, their messages through their own voices and their own lived experience. Um, and then convey these messages to the right um, spots in order to, within the, the sort of decision-making bodies and policy-making bodies, to make change happen, to, to lead to small or big transformations within the food system, starting with, you know, very simple changes to the infrastructure in, in urban markets or... Um, or huge transformations as in crop diversification in Zambia. So this, this citizen agency, this kind of groundswell of engagement from the bottom up, I think we believe to be really important. I'm looking at Alejandro now, you can't see that. Um, but I think perhaps you could finish um, with something around the importance of citizen agency. Um, and I think if you could perhaps acknowledge our partner, Hivos, um, who've been uh, the, the partner that we've been specifically working with on this, uh, that might also give our listeners a chance to follow up with some of the work they're doing. Of course. My, my, my take would be as follows. And it's quite simple. If you take seriously the idea that we need sustainable diets and that diet needs to be healthy for people, healthy for planet. So if we take that seriously, and we, I think we all do, uh, but you also realize that it has, to be, it has to be meaningful and it has to be a com a appropriate for people in their context, in their incomes, in their traditions. So if you take those two things seriously, it leads you very closely and very and very easily into the informal market because this is where it is this is where most people are getting their are getting their food and so so for change to happen going back to your original question of the citizen agency for change to happen basically it means that you cannot come and tell people what sustainable diets means it means that in their context in their own uh, uh, local uh, places, traditions, food, uh, culinary traditions, etc. It needs to come, change needs to come from within. And so what you need to do is recognize where is, where are the engines of change and then help them as you can. So this is the whole operating principle of uh, the HEOS and IID project sustainable diet. Well, but I would agree that it's, it applies to everything we do. We cannot go into, say, going back to Emma, uh, talking about raw milk. You can't just go and say, well, everybody needs to eat pasteurized milk from now on because people actually want to drink raw milk. So you just need to first understand what people want and why they want it. And then you can start thinking of change. But that is the first project. Okay, well, I think we have to draw to a close. Um, this has been really interesting. It's a complex issue. Um, and I think... I say this in every IID podcast, but <laughs> it's quite clear that some of the issues we're dealing with are very complex and there's no simple answer. And it's why we rely on the voices of many people contributing to the work that we do to try and find solutions and understand different potential solutions. Um, we should thank HIVOS, our partners. They're a civil society organization based in the Netherlands. This is part of the Dialogue and Dissent program of work uh, supported by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and we've very much enjoyed working on this. Uh, thanks to our partners um, on Skype. Uh, really good to hear from them. I'm going to finish by asking Coz and Alejandro for just a two-word or three-word. What's the biggest change you think should happen that you'd like to see and one that you think might happen? Um, as as uh, my esteemed colleague Bill Borley would put it, I, I think we should all be meeting people where they are. Thank you.
I'll, I'll borrow from actually a, a, a colleague that I just visited in India who was saying 97% of the milk here is traded informally, 3% formally, but 97% of the budget goes to the formal bit. We need to change that. We need to make the investment in time, energy, understanding that goes into the informal sector be commensurate to its importance and to how it feeds people all over the world. Two very clear messages there. Thank you. You can find out more about the Sustainable Diets for All program on both the IIED and HEVOS websites. Visit IIED.org or HEVOS.org, that's H-I-V-O-S dot org, and search for Sustainable Diets. You have been listening to the Make Change Happen podcast from IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. The podcast is produced by our in-house communications team. For more information about IIED and our work, please visit our website at www.iied.org. We greatly value our listeners' opinions, so please leave us your feedback and comments on our website podcast page.